Let us pray. Loving God, in the middle of our noisy lives, we come to listen for the word you have for us. So silence in us now any voice but your own. And startle us with the new possibilities created by your love and your grace and your forgiveness. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture text today is from 1 Kings chapter 19. Listen now. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the boom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place... At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? This is the word of the Lord. Rarely do I read the stories of the prophets in Scripture and think, Wow, that person is relatable. A prophet, as we know them in the Old Testament, was a person passionate for God and God's people and served as a spokesperson for God to the community, primarily speaking to people in power, the kings, the priests, other elites within Israel and Judah, talking about things like national security, economic policies, government stability, and military decisions, 
They shared the ways the leaders and also the community were falling short, not taking care of the poor or the widows or the children or how they were failing to worship God. Being a prophet was not a job that won them a lot of friends. Sometimes prophets acted out God's message in unexpected ways. The prophet Ezekiel, he once laid on his side for 430 days to act out the siege of Jerusalem. Isaiah, he walked around the city naked to reveal the coming defeat of Egypt and Ethiopia. And just prior to the story that we just read, Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal to what we might best understand as a prophetic science experiment, to see whose God could make a bull spontaneously combust. Elijah wins. I admire the faithfulness and the passion of the prophets. I find them endlessly fascinating, and I love their faith but I rarely read their stories and think, I understand you. This particular moment, though, in the story we read in Elijah's life, is the exception. First Kings 19, it might be one of the most famous stories of a prophet in scripture, and it's not because of his mighty deeds or strange actions or poignant message. But here, it's because we find a person of faith who is at the end of his rope. Particularly in this world today, as we read statistics on burnout and a failing and falling economy and monkeypox and violence and pain, and on and on and on, we can understand someone who is at the end of his rope. We get how easy it could be to want to curl up in the shade of a tree and isolate ourselves away from everyone and everything. I have been reading... A book of Howard Thurman's prayers and meditations lately. And if you're looking for something for your own spiritual or devotional life for the summer, I commend it to you. More than 70 years ago, Thurman writes this, our little lives, our big problems, These we place upon thy altar. War and threat of war has covered us with heavy shadows, making the days big with forebodings, the nights crowded with frenzied dreams and restless churnings. We do not know how to do what we know to do. We do not know how to be what we know to be. Our little lives, our big problems, these we place upon thy altar. Elijah could have used this prayer. He had been called by God when the prophets of Israel were being killed. And it started when King Ahab married Jezebel, an outsider to Israel. Jezebel had money and she had power, which Israel desperately needed. And she also had an intense devotion to the Phoenician god Baal. Once in Israel, she recruited prophets of Baal to spread the faith. And then she started killing the prophets of Israel. That's where Elijah 
comes in, God sends Elijah to tell King Ahab to stop the killing. He doesn't listen. God sends a three-year drought. King Ahab still doesn't listen. The prophets of Israel suffer. And eventually it comes to this strange standoff between Elijah and the prophets with the bull. And Elijah wins. And then he takes out the prophets of Baal. And then everything changes. Violence, it turns out, begets violence. Jezebel threatens Elijah's life and he runs in fear and despair. We do not know how to do what we know to do. We do not know how to be what we know to be. Our little lives are big problems. These we place upon thy altar. Elijah goes from an intense victory to a place of giving up. Wearied by years of violence and frustrated that in all of this effort, he could not make himself better. He could not make things better. He could not make the world better. And therefore, he isolates himself from everything and everyone and sits under a tree in the wilderness and tells God that he is done. He doesn't have the will to keep doing this anymore. And this is exactly the feeling that I worry about for so many of us today. For those who have been working toward peace or social justice or racial equality or environmental sustainability and not seeing the world changing fast enough. I worry for all who have experienced unexpected loss, life that has changed in an instant. For everyone whose company has had layoffs and has had the rug pulled from underneath them. For all the kids who seem okay one day and then all of a sudden become distant. For everyone who was planning to retire, but this last month's market has made that seem impossible. And for all who have heard news from a doctor that they were not expecting or did not want to hear. Sometimes in these exhausting and difficult moments, we have a hard time seeing how or where God could show up. On a Monday morning in April, 1996, Kate Braystrup woke up just like normal. Her husband, Drew, went off to work as a state patrol officer in Maine. And after ushering their four kids to school, she started her day. She was a writer. A few hours later, everything changed. A driver had lost control of his car on the freeway and hit Drew's patrol car. And he died in an instant. About an hour after receiving the horrible news of Drew's tragic death, Kate was at home with her good friend, Monica. Kate was in the depths of despair, not knowing where to turn next, questioning whether God could show up to her. And at some point, the doorbell rang. Her friend Monica got up to go answer it, and there on the front step stood a young man dressed in a spiffy dark suit, smelling like soap and virtue. And the young man handed a pamphlet out that outlined assurance to salvation and asked Monica, have you heard the good news? And for a long second, Monica glared at him not sure whether to just knock the pamphlets out of his hand or laugh hysterically. And she compromised and 
shut the door. Not long after, the doorbell rang again, and this time Kate opened it. And standing in front of her was her neighbor, an elderly woman with whom she had exchanged no more than a dozen words in 10 years. She had pot holders in her hands, which held a pan of warm brownies as tears were rolling down her cheeks. I just heard, she said. Kate writes, that pan of brownies, it later turned out, was the leading edge of a tsunami of food that came to my children and me, a wave that did not receive for many months after Drew's death. I didn't know that my family and I would be fed three meals a day for weeks and weeks. I did not anticipate that neighborhood men would come to drywall the playroom and build bookshelves and mow the lawn and get the oil changed in my car. I didn't know that my house would be cleaned and my laundry would be done and that I would have embraces and listening ears, that I would not be abandoned to do the labor of mourning alone. All I knew was that my neighbor was standing on the front stoop with her brownies and her tears And she was good news. It was enough, she writes. It was all the presence of God that I needed, that I did not expect. God shows up in all sorts of ways in this world. Sometimes in a pan of brownies, and the tears of a neighbor. While sitting under that tree, ready to give up, God shows up to Elijah in the form of an angel bearing food and drink. God shows up with a meal and an invitation to take a rest. And this isn't just one meal or just one little nap, that wouldn't be enough. There's this cycle of food and drink and sleep here for Elijah, time and space and nourishment. This is something that many of us are not good at, allowing ourselves enough rest, enough nourishment. In the sense that God is in the rest and the nourishment, and the quiet. We do not know how to do what we know to do. We do not know how to be what we know to be. Our little lives, our big problems, these we place upon thy altar. When Elijah gets a bit stronger, he travels deeper into the desert and up a sacred mountain until the voice of God comes to him, saying, I'm going to show myself to you. By this time, Elijah's looking to hear the voice of God, and he's heard God's voice before. That was part of his job. He heard God in the king's court and while talking to a crowd, He'd heard God's voice in the pouring rain, in the voice of a widow, in a chaotic battle. He knew God could speak to him, and so he listened. He listened for God in all the ways that he thought God would speak, in all the ways he knew God to speak. First, in the wind. It moved so strong, it split a mountain. But God was not in the wind. Then Elijah felt the earthquake, an obvious sign of God, but God did not speak in the earthquake. Next, there was a fire. God is known to speak in fire. That is how God got Moses' attention. Elijah listened for God in the fire. 
but heard nothing. And then there was silence, the sound of sheer silence. Now, Elijah was a man of words and fire and power and dramatic struggle. But in this very moment, that is not where God showed up. In the silence, God gave Elijah new hope and direction. I have to admit that I am someone who loves silence. I crave it. I keep my car quiet. I could talk forever about the ways that God shows up in quiet moments, in times that are still and purposeful and away from everything else. But I'm constantly reminded that God is not limited to the ways that I expect God to show up. God is not limited to silence. God shows up wherever we are. In the noise and in the crowds and where there is fighting and where there is music, God shows up in joyous celebrations and when we are at the end of our rope. There will be times, times you will hear God's voice in the fire and in the wind and in the earthquake and in the silence. And there will be times you hear God's good news in a pan of brownies and the tears from a neighbor. And whatever unexpected place you did not think to look, God shows up with sustaining love and promise, ready to hear and hold all of our lives and all of our problems Let me close with the end of Howard Thurman's prayer, offering it as our own this day. Our little lives, our big problems, these we place upon thy altar. Brood over our spirits, O oh, Father, blow upon whatever dream thou hast for us, that there may glow once again upon our hearths the light from thy altar. Pour out upon us whatever our spirits need of shock, of lift, of release that we may find strength for these days, courage and hope for tomorrow. In confidence, we rest in thy sustaining grace, which makes possible triumph in defeat, gain in loss, and love in hate. We rejoice this day to say, our little lives, our big problems, these we place upon thy altar. Amen.